It's a wonderful privilege to be back here with you today. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was over in Port Townsend. And you know, you have to be wanting to go to Port Townsend to be there. It's not some place that you just wind up. And they had a little reception at a house that they were building for Habitat there. And all the volunteers were coming in and I had on a name tag and they'd come over and shake my hand and they'd go, oh, you're the reason that we're here. And I'd look at them and smile and say, well, actually you're the reason that I'm here. And you are the reason that I'm here today. And we are one, even if you're one of those 100 new people, even if you've never yet written a check or raised a hammer or done the various, uh, served on a committee, the other things that you can do to help this Habitat affiliate to build homes, we are one from this moment. And we are transformed as these lives are transformed. This story, the ones you saw on the screen, and the many others that are around the world, those that we get to share in in Guatemala and places around the world, we are all one, and our personal transformation is the story of those transformations. I have the job from time to time of going around, I'll be doing it in the next couple of weeks, and working with Habitat affiliates and talking to them about the economic impact of their affiliate. And we use a multiplier for that. How many people in here involved with the Chamber of Commerce? I see hands all over the place. Everybody knows we use multipliers. And the multiplier that's perhaps most famous in this country is a seven. And that seven came up some years ago by an economics professor, many years ago actually, who suggested that um, that might be the turnover of a dollar in your community when it's spent. And he made his case, it included the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and so on. And it was basically just drawn out of thin air. But people bought it, we chamber folks love to use it, because we love to tell you that that's how much impact there is in tourism or whatever goes on in the community. And so the seven has become an accepted number. But the seven is always questioned. Where did it come from? What does it mean? And several years ago, I was working with an affiliate in another state and the executive director and I were talking and I mentioned this seven multiplier. He leaned over and he put his hand on my knee and he said, son, I was there when that number was created. I was a colleague of that economics professor. And he knows, and I know, and everybody else know, that number is meaningless. Nobody has ever really determined what the economic multiplier is. Now the building industry has its own multiplier. There are other multipliers out there. The building industries is a little closer to home and it stops with the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. It doesn't try to go to a seven. But, um, this man was talking to me, and we were talking about Habitat, and he said, I've got a secret for you. That seven, it's way too low. He said, I think it's more like a 10, and who knows what its real value is. When you look at the stories that you saw up here, when you hear Heidi's story, when you hear the stories that those of you who've been coming for years to these breakfasts and hearing families share, what number would you put on that? How could you ever determine what the multiplying effect is of that thing? And that success that you have with these families. There's an old Hebrew tradition that says, he who saves one life saves the world entire. What does that mean then when we save not just one life, but hundreds of lives? thousands of lives around the world, millions of lives. What is that multiplying effect? I was a school teacher when Millard Fuller came along and founded Habitat for Humanity and we knew each other from the past and so he came looking for that warm body I tell people any one of you would have done. I just happened to be in the way at the time. And he came looking and asking me to get involved with Habitat and I wasn't convinced until one day, about this time of year, back in 1977, in a classroom in Dawson, Georgia, a little girl, seventh grade, still couldn't read. None of the kids in my class could read. And she said to me, why do we have to learn this old stuff anyway? And I said, because if you get an education, you'll have a better life. And her response to me was, yeah, that's what they told my mama. 
So I went to see the mama that evening, and I found them living in a shack with literally no doors, no windows, no running water, no electricity, and no hope. And I went straight back to America's Georgia, and I said to Millard, you win. I'm going to get involved with Habitat because I'm not reaching those kids at the level they need to be reached. Fast forward a few years, and I've been working with Habitat for a while, and we help a homeowner named May Pearl to get a house in America's Georgia, and May Pearl gets in, and the house spins downhill pretty fast. She's not really ready to take care of the house. It happens. We're working with human beings. And so we're trying to figure out how to get May Pearl to take the initiative and get things taken care of in her house. And after much struggle, a number of her neighbors came to sit with her, all of whom were women, all of whom were Habitat homeowners. And they said to her, May Pearl, we've come to talk to you about your house. May Pearl burst into tears because a lot of people had been to that house. And she said, y'all, it ain't my fault, which is good English in South Georgia, by the way. And they said, we didn't come here about fault. We just came to say, if you want to fix your house up, we'll help you. So she did and they did. Together, they fixed her house back up. If we were in America's Georgia today, I'd have you in front of that house telling that story. It's not perfect, but it's a long way from where it was then. And then a marvelous thing happened. May Pearl, on her own initiative, went out to our local technical college and got her GED. And this set off a wildfire among these other women, none of whom had their high school diplomas. And so they began to get their degrees or their diplomas. I heard about it and gave May Pearl $35, which was the cost of taking the test in those days. And I said, you tell your friends, when they bring me the passing score, I'll write them a check as well. So believe me, I never went without knowing how things were going. And I remember standing out there and watching a 56-year-old woman walk across the stage in a little plastic cap and gown and pick up her diploma. And one by one, they succeeded until it got down to one last woman whose name was Jessie. And Jessie began to make excuses and say, you know, I don't like to drive at night. I don't like to go out there by myself now that all my friends are done. And it was May Pearl who went to the others and said, we cannot let Jesse fail. We'll have to set up a driving schedule. We'll take a book of our own and read it or work on our other studies if we're doing something else, but we cannot let Jesse fail. And sure enough, the day came when Jesse walked across that stage and got her degree. I retired from Habitat almost two years ago. And literally the last week before I retired, I went back out to that technical college and I watched another of these women, my age, I'm 66 now, we, I was 64 at the time, and Mary Cross at 64 walked across that stage again, this time to pick up a diploma that would allow her to open a daycare center in her home. She is never going to be able to retire to Guatemala and do the things that I'm doing because she didn't have that education over the years. So she's had to work hard for it. And her dream is that when she can retire, she's a janitress at Habitat. She empties the garbage cans every day. But when she can retire, she'll still be able to have a daycare center in her home. Believe me, she told me about that progress every single day. And I could feel the transforming power of what we were involved in. But imagine for me the transformation from school teacher in a failing classroom to helping to build houses and watching families, one right after the other, many homeowners continue in their education and do well and to be able to say what that did for them. Now, Habitat has critics. Can you imagine that? Critics of Habitat. There are people who say, for instance, well, that number that they use, that multiplier, comes out of thin air. It comes out of nowhere. It's meaningless. But what value can you place on standing watching a homeowner, an African-American woman in South Georgia, who at the dedication of her home says to the crowd, I felt like I was dead and buried and I've been dug up. Or another one later who said, I felt all thrown away. And these women then turn their lives around and begin to do things for their children and their grandchildren and others and impact lives. Where do you put the number on that? 
There are other critics who say, well, those families you hear about, they would have succeeded anyway. It had nothing to do with that house. Heidi doesn't think that. The Minnie and Jesse and May Pearl, they don't think that. Mary Cross doesn't think that. Noel Garcia, a young man out of Florida, doesn't think that. First generation of his family to go to college. And I could go on and on. Yuri and Nadia Sorota, who came over here from the Ukraine and got a home near Atlanta, Georgia, they don't think that. They know that what you do is powerful, that it transforms their lives. I think one of the most powerful stories I know also happened right at the end of my time working with Habitat. Just a year or two before that, Millard Fuller, the founder of Habitat, had died. And there had been a funeral right after he died out at Koinonia Farm where this whole thing started. But a month or so later, there was a memorial service in Atlanta. I was not able to be there. I was in Guatemala building houses that day. But I saw a video when I came back, and there was a young man in that video who was very excited. He sat on the front row, and he was with the family, and I couldn't figure out who he was until finally he got to the podium and he said, my name is Judah Slavkovsky, and I bring you greetings from Sisters Oregon where 40 families live in habitat houses. And that got a nice round of applause. And I thought, well, what a nice young man. He's a volunteer out there and he's come to speak about habitat. But he went on for a little bit and suddenly he said, I was 10 years old when habitat found me and my family living in a house in Sisters with ice on the walls inside in the wintertime and mold growing up those walls in the summertime. He said, we didn't get to work on our house, my, brother, my sisters and I, because we were too young, but we got to plant the apple trees in front of the house and we've enjoyed the apples over the years. And then he says, and now today, and then sort of charmingly corrects himself, well, not today exactly, but in a few months, I am going to graduate a doctor from Harvard University. And so just days before I retired, I saw the video of Judah graduating. He had a white carnation in his lapel in honor of Millard Fuller. And Millard's wife was there, and they were taking video of him. And he said, Millard Fuller changed the world with his tool belt. Today, I got my tool belt, and I am going to change the world as well. What value do you put on that? Is it a seven? Is it a 10? Is it a hundred? In my faith, I follow a young man who once stood on a hillside in Israel and took a handful of fishes and loaves and fed 5,000 people with it. What is your multiplier? What do you use? That young man also said, those who follow me and give up houses and families and lives for my sake will receive a hundred times more in this life and many times beyond that in the next life. Let me tell you, he understated the case. We now have built 500,000 houses worldwide. We have housed two million people, one million of them children. And I tell people, I live in Guatemala where there are 35,000 houses. I shouldn't even have to pay rent. I could just go from house to house and never spend the same night in the same house, you know, ever. And everywhere I go, people walk up to me because I'm wearing a Habitat cap or they hear me say Habitat. I'm a Habitat homeowner. My sister's a Habitat homeowner. Thank you for what you have done for me. And over and over again, I will spend the rest of my days there in Guatemala being thanked by people who got habitat houses, watching their lives transform. And who knows but what on that day that will be my last on the earth, the person standing next to me, giving me comfort, will have been raised up in a habitat house. Because we have had an impact, we have transformed, and we have been transformed by this process. And just for an extra benefit, I'm down there in Guatemala, involved with Habitat, building on a Habitat site. I met some little kids whose daddy is dead. They didn't get a Habitat house. They lived down the street. They would follow us to the store and take treats with us when we went down to get a Coke or whatever. 
And the last day, the owner of the store said to me, God bless you for whatever you do for those little boys because their father's dead. There are 11 kids in the family and the mother can't feed them. I went back out to the van and sat in it and sobbed. Then I went back inside and talked to the store owners and I set up an account so I could start supporting that family. That's been a year and a half. I never had kids of my own. I have four of the finest little boys in the world. And when I go there, I go there as often as I can get down there. I don't live uh, as close as, as I would like to. But I have these little kids in my arms and I'm talking to them and they are now imagining the day when they can go to high school. That was completely out of the question a year and a half ago. Now there are Habitat folks who come to build there. This group has been there. We hope many more will come. We hope all of you will come. And these folks were involved not only in building houses, but building lives there in Guatemala and in San Lucas Toliman. And these little boys have a promise of a new day and they didn't even get touched by a Habitat house. One last figure. We're building with another group in another part of the country and we're building 85 houses there. This group also paid for all of the infrastructure on their site and they came recently to build the first houses on this new site and they were informed that when we drilled the well for the 85 families there, we struck such a good vein of water that the city is now going to build a water tower there and the water from that site will, will help 1,000 families around that site who have never had access to decent water. That's impact. And that is the number that you try to imagine. What multiplier could you possibly use? God bless you for all that you've been doing, for all that you will do, and go forth and tell your friends about Habitat and its impact. And I hope one day you'll find a way to define that number. Amen.